Hello, all you sexy entrepreneurial filmmakers. You, I have a great podcast this week for you, and it's with the CEO of Tiff Peers Handling. We had a great, great conversation. It lasted like way, way longer than we thought, and it's all about well, how do you get a sales agent when you go to a festival? How do you pitch to get your project produced? How do you network your way up? Because he was a nobody and then became the CEO of TIFF for 24 years. Plus, submission tips straight from the CEO of TIFF as to when is the best time to submit to TIFF and what are some tips to getting into TIFF. And you'll get the mathematical proof from me of why Hollywood is dying. It's a mathematical explanation, so just follow it along if you're analytically inclined. Enjoy. All right, we're here with Piers Handling, the CEO, CEO of TIFF, Toronto International Film Festival. The thing that you know that's here in Toronto that is like one of the top three or in the top three film festivals in the world. There's Cannes, there's TIFF, and I don't know the third one. Which... That's a good question. Berlin, Venice, Sundance are probably okay, so all, much. yeah. He's a, he's a very nice guy, so he's putting them all in the same category, but TIFF is actually the number one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank so, you. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about, first of all, you're the CEO of TIFF, so what does that entail? Well, I run the entire organization. Of course, now it's a pretty big organization. It's not just the 11-day uh, festival in September. We're now in our own building, Tiff Bell Lightbox, where we're shooting this interview. We opened this about eight years ago. It's a year-round programming institution. We run five cinemas every day. We have exhibition spaces, year-round um, children's programming, programming for people of all ages. We run a cinematheque. We have a film reference library. It's really open to the general public. So uh, I'm responsible for all that, the entire, uh, all of the stuff, the strategic direction, the future, planning, thinking, budgeting, um, just making sure that everything runs on the rails and um, that we're well positioned for the future. I mean, that's really my job as CEO. Right. Obviously to oversee every single part of it, the operational side of it, the administrative side, the budgetary side, uh, the human resource side, as well as the artistic. So all of those people report up to me. So it's not, you don't select the films, you don't sit there with a cigar, just with your feet up on the desk and people just, sir, do you like this film? No. Well, the old days used to be a cigarette. It was uh, probably sometimes feet on desk. Um, I'm certainly involved in the film selection at the festival. I've never really given that up entirely. Is there a reason why? Because as the CEO, you don't need to. No, you don't, except I really feel that the hands-on part of it is really important, um, that you're actually connected through to people in the industry. You have a real feel for it, seat of the pants stuff. It gives you a legitimacy, obviously, when you're dealing with people and you're still involved in the film selection. But you're right, it's probably a bit of an anachronism that the CEO is still involved at this level um, of, of the, the operation. I mean, I think most CEOs kind of float, but um, I do many, many different things, of course, so I've just managed to keep a little bit of my finger in that pie. Right. I don't do as much as I used to. I did, used to do an immense amount, of course. Um, and now there's other people who are really um, programming the festival and thinking through the festival. But I still want to make sure that I'm in touch with the industry because the festival really plugs you into the industry internationally. And I think for an institution of our nature, which is partially a cultural institution, but it's also very, very connected through, through to the industry. So it has that kind of immediacy, uh, that, that kind of import. I think it's really important that the CEO is plugged in, has a legitimacy, has a profile there. I remember when we had a conversation before, you were giving a talk. You didn't start at CEO at, the, at TIFF as the CEO, obviously. You can't just... Not at all. No, no. I started as a programmer. I started as a programmer. And then how did you work your way up? And the reason I'm asking is because, remember, we're going to talk about innovation in film. And for me, one of the ways that I think filmmakers should innovate is also by taking an entrepreneurial attitude towards filmmaking. And so don't just screen it for your mom in the basement. And also learn how distribution works, learn how marketing works. It doesn't mean you need to be a marketer, but learn those things and then psychology as well, sure. which is another thing we talk about. But I want to hear, how did you use your entrepreneurial side to get to where you are right now? Well, I had a skill set when I came to the festival. That was useful. Um, I mean, the guy that was running it was my closest friend. But at the same time, he, um, and I phoned him up and I said, you know, I'm moving from Ottawa to Toronto. Have you got anything for me? But I had two key assets, I think. One of them was that I was one of the acknowledged experts in Canadian cinema. And that was obviously a sellable asset because very few people had that type of expertise. How did you get that 
expertise? On, on the job learning, to be honest. Uh, my degree was not in film, it was in history and philosophy. Um, I worked in Ottawa for 10 years at the Canadian Film Institute, developed a, an interest in Canadian cinema, and the organization allowed me to explore that. It was a virgin territory, literally. There were very, very few people doing that kind of serious research and curating. So I got extremely intrigued and started to publish a lot, do a lot of researching, so I became an acknowledged expert. I mean, there were very, very few of us who were seriously examining Canadian film, the history of Canadian film, uh, showing Canadian film, curating it. Um, so I had that level, that, that expertise. Um, but I think just as important as that, I was also, uh, I came up through publications. I had the skill set of being able to work with typesetters, work with uh, printers. I knew how to write, I knew how to assemble a program book. Um, and that was the skill set that they needed in the festival. I mean, it was incredibly small in those days when I joined. It was about the seventh year, I think. Right, and so how the, small, small? I think the permanent staff was about five people at that point in time. In fact, it may not even, even have been that many. It was mostly contract staff, including myself. So you were on contract for three, four, or five months, and then as soon as the festival was over, of course, we were, our contracts were over until the following spring. So it was incredibly tiny. Um, but Wayne was always looking around for, or the festival was always looking around for skilled people. And I enjoyed writing and researching. So I combined that with, uh, I had some ideas around Canadian film. We wanted to do a retrospective of the films of David Cronenberg, and so I said to, to Wayne, let's do a book at the same time. And what year is this? Is this is the early year? 80s. And um, yeah, the, the early 80s, and there was no real book in English on Cronenberg at that point in time, and so it was the first major retrospective of David's work in North America. He was a bit of a pariah in Canada at that point in time. And so we did a publication which did extremely well. It's still in demand, it's out of print. Um, and we interviewed David and I commissioned a whole series of essays and I wrote for it as well. So it was you know, part of our mutual desire to, to situate film in a serious context, not just to show the films, but also to provide material around it. And the following year we did this massive Canadian retrospective, um, I think in 1984. And we also did a couple of publications. We went to a commercial publisher I think it was Irwin, and um, we did an encyclopedia of Canadian film, and we did a, a, another collection of essays just on Canadian cinema, assembled a whole bunch of good, good articles. And um, so I supervised all that. Um, I mean, I loved the, the, the idea of writing and editing and collaborating and, uh, and pulling things together. Right. So it was just, you know, I had these, these two very specific skill sets. I also had a great curiosity about cinema, and... Um, Wayne and I. Sorry to interrupt. Are you push, are you pitching these curiosities of yours, or are they coming up, coming to you and saying, "Hey, you pitch me something that you no, think the, is the good." No, the Canadian stuff I absolutely pitched to uh, to Wayne, who was the director of the festival, completely. So you're I mean, right. they were still running. They were running Canadian films, but not a lot of them. And I said, "I think we can do a lot more. I think we can really make an impact here." Um, and that sort of led to the Cronenberg, and then it led to this massive Canadian retrospective, and then we started a Canadian program at the festival called Perspective Canada. As a part of TIFF, underneath? Absolutely, under a part of TIFF. It was a key program. We gathered all the Canadian films together, documentary, short films, feature films, uh, experimental films, into one program, which people didn't think was going to actually be very successful at the time. They thought that there wasn't an audience for Canadian cinema. And I think the great thing was that it actually worked. I mean, the Canadian retro worked, the Cronenberg retro worked. We got a lot of press and publicity, huge audiences. And uh, when we actually mounted the Canadian program, which turned into a year-round program, we started to discover key films. My American Cousin was one of the first ones that got picked up for commercial distribution when we ran it. And so the industry started to pay serious attention. Mm -hmm. um, we, we also kind of crested or, or, or we, we, we um, arrived at a moment in time when there was a bunch of young Toronto filmmakers starting to make serious films. Adam McGoyan, Pat Patricia Rosema, Deepa Mehta, Peter Mettler, uh, Bruce McDonald, Jeremy Pedeswa, all of these Toronto-based filmmakers were here as students making their short films. And we just grabbed them at the moment when they were making their short films or just about to make their first feature film. Is that something that TIFF now does as well, is to look at new talent, or is it so big that now new talent comes to you? It's, it works both ways, to be honest. I mean, now the reputation of the festival is so big that I think new talent, um, by its very nature, will find us in one way or another. A lot of new talent around the world doesn't really know where to go. They're not really they, they're not experts in terms of navigating the festival world. But of course, they run into friends right away, people who help them, uh, critics, producers, 
sales agents. So as they see the work of new directors, they'll say, you should take your you know, film to this festival, that festival, talk to Toronto, talk to Rotterdam, talk to Locarno, um, submit you. So the, 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 there's a kind of a growing network, and we're incredibly well networked now. Um, we do a lot of traveling around the world, every single continent. We're very aggressive about the traveling. So it's very easy uh, when you're doing that kind of traveling to establish a, a really serious network. And of course, as I said, now the festival is so prominent that a lot of people are very, very aware of us. I mean, we're networked around the world. And it started from just being networked in Toronto. And you had your friend uh, Wayne, I believe? Wayne Clarkson was the uh, first professional director of the festival. Okay, so you had your friend Wayne. That was your in into TIFF. A lot of people want to know, how do I network? How do I get connected? And it seems like you had a connection, and then that was really good for you. Now you're here smoking cigars. Sure, so exactly. How can a filmmaker utilize networking? What tips? Just get it. It's as simple as just getting out there. I mean, I started, as I said, I was not in the film world at all. I was in, in my degree was in history. So when I left university, I went to Ottawa, and I just went to see films. I just hung out where films were being shown. And I immediately got to know some of the people um, who were just there, you know, people like me, film fanatics, and then the organizers. So when I applied for a job, which was a complete fluke, I just opened the newspaper one day and they were advertising two jobs. And I was lucky enough to get the job. Uh, I had actually been around. I had been around for about six months or so. Um, they had ran a small little film festival, this organization. And You're referring to TIFF? No, this was in Ottawa, actually. Okay. This is the Canadian Film Institute in Ottawa. Okay. This is where I spent the first 10 years of my career, right. well before right. TIFF was okay. even you know, a glint in the eyes of Bill Marshall and uh, Hank Van Der Kolk and uh, Dusty Cole. Um, no, I just hung around. I hung around where films were being shown. And then I hung around this organization. I was lucky enough to get a job, literally at the lowest entry level. Um, I was totally overqualified for the job. They were afraid I was going to leave it quickly. But I persuaded them, no, I was going to stick it out for at least a year. And of course, one thing led to another there, and I rose to be number two in the organization. But that was my film education. Um, and that networking, of course, I met a bunch of people who became very important to me in the rest of my life. Um, there were very few film organizations like this in Canada, and it tended to attract people. Um, these small organizations, the Canadian Film Institute in Ottawa, the Ontario Film Institute here in, uh, in Toronto, the Cinematheque uh, Québécoise in Montreal, or the National Film Board, the CBC. I mean, if you're interested in production, you would end up either in the Film Board or the CBC. Um, so very few centers of gravity. There was a f couple of film magazines at that point, right. Cinema Canada and Motion, so I started to write for them, got to know the editors, then of course you began to get to know other writers, and you just started to circulate in that small group of people. And uh, you worked out very quickly who were like-minded people, who were people that you respected, who were people that you thought would continue in the industry and continue to go on. And that was just, you know, it's an informal network. And as I said, you don't really know um, how it's going to develop and evolve. And to be honest, it all started at university. I started at Queen's where I went. So Queen's had the very first film department in Canada. And uh, some of the students there are still my close friends and they're still making films. Um, the professor who taught there, one of them, is, was a lifelong friend until he died. He was my mentor and a close friend and collaborator. He worked on many programs here at the film festival. He helped me start Perspective Canada. Mm. He was a source that I always turned to. We edited books together. We worked on many projects. That was where I started my networking, to be honest, at university. And when I met Peter, um, I, I had no idea how influential he was going to be in the rest of my life. In the same way that when I met so many of these other people, both at university and in Ottawa at the CFI, I had no idea that Wayne, you know, was the guy, he was working in the same organization, he was in charge of exhibitions or was working on the exhibition side because we had a film program, we were showing films, curating films. I had no idea that, you know, this guy that I started to pal around with, we became really close friends, that we were going to be connected for the rest of our life. Um, he went on to run the festival, went on to run the, the um, Canadian Film Centre, then went on to run Telefilm Canada and the Ontario Media Development Corporation. You know, became a very important player and person in the Canadian film industry. Um, so that was just a connection I made by, you know, when I was 21. And it was so lucky. I mean, I met other people there as well. People have gone on to become critics like Jeff Bevere, who, you know, wrote for the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star for many, many years. Um, other young filmmakers, some people who are now no longer around, have sort of moved out of the industry. Michelle Mayhew, who's the CEO and managing director of uh, TIFF, I met in Ottawa at the CFI. I mean, our connection goes back to the 70s. 
Um, so that's another, you know, example of networking because she knew me and I brought her into right. the film festival and now she's number two in this organization. So, you know, you begin to identify and isolate people early in your career and you see how their, their career paths move and uh, sometimes they just move away from you and other times they move close to you. And you say, you know, I can work with this person, I trust this person, they're very knowledgeable and uh, they'll make a good partner. Right, it sounds like you had if it's like a dartboard, you had a lot of darts at that dartboard because some of them totally. didn't work out and totally. some of them worked out. Well, you're not thinking about that, to be honest. You're not thinking about, in a calculated way, is, is this person going to be useful to yeah, you? Yeah, and if you do, they're going to sense that. They're, yeah, they're not going to exactly. like you. It's just more, I mean, I, it's the way film collaboration happens. It's the way films get made. You know, I want to work with this actor. I want to work with this writer. I want to work with this director. I want to work with this producer. You know, you like people. Right. You have a project and, and then... Uh, you know, many directors use the same cinematographer, they use the same editor, they, see, they use the same yeah, composer. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, once you've got a team together, and of course there's some very, very famous teams, film right. teams. Yeah. Um, uh, Cronenberg happened to work with, David Cronenberg happened to work with almost the same group of people. Um, somebody like Ingmar Bergman, you know, one of the greatest filmmakers in the history of cinema, worked with the same group of right, people too. Right. It was like a family. Yeah. And I think there's many, many examples of that in cinema. So. Yeah, that's, that is, of course, networking. You just get to meet people, and you like them, and you want to spend time with them. So networking is not necessarily going to networking events. It's going to outside interests of yours. Like you said, hey, I was a history really? major, and then I went to something that was tangential to what I was doing. Yeah, I mean, I think when people sort of say, do I have to go to parties, or do I have to do the cocktail circuit, or whatever? No, it's, you don't really have to do that. I mean, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. I'm not sure I've really met people that way that have been in my life for the rest of my life. Um, I mean, it's, they're great networking opportunities, of course, and there's a lot of them in, in, both around the festival and here in Toronto. It's more um, informal networking of, of a different kind. It's like going to the Toronto Film Co-op, um, or it's at university, obviously, you're networking right. there or it's going to film societies, or it's going to the Cinematheque here, or it's going to the festival. And, you know, Would you recommend stuff that's not related to film? Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, people should totally broaden their interests. You know, you'll find really interesting people who may not be um, film specialists, but they'll be very, very... They're thinkers. You know, they have ideas. They'll provoke you. I mean, they could be musicians, they could be painters, they could be artists, sculptors. You, you know, it could be just people. Um, people have got administrative skills. You know, people are really, really smart when it comes to finances. Uh, that kind of networking. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of people, of course, nowadays are on, on the look for the, you know, for these types of, of contacts and, and connections. Um, so you just don't know at the end of the day who you're going to meet right. up with. All, you know, my only advice is just keep meeting with people. Film is a collaborative art um, for most people and so it's hard to sort of stay at home and you know work in your basement. You can do that but I think on the whole film is very much a it's it's a social public activity and I know a lot of filmmakers who are not that social, not that public and, and they still manage to they still manage to navigate the world. Well I think they're very very talented. They've got a talent that immediately attracts people to them as opposed to them having to go out. I mean, I think it's almost impossible not to go out to people. But of course, if you're incredibly talented, um, people will find you. You know, they really, really will. Uh, you know, when you think of somebody like a David Lynch, who's, you know, his first feature film, Eraserhead, is a very strange, bizarre piece of work. Yeah. Um, but it's so exceptional. You know, so I can imagine David going out as a young, shy, because I, you know, I somewhat know him and he's not an extrovert. I can imagine David going out into the world, you know, and slowly showing his film, and then them getting very excited about it. I mean, I, you know, Guy Madden, who's a Canadian filmmaker, was exactly like that. You know, Guy was in the building last week with his new film. He was talking about how shy he was originally, and how the festival here in Toronto helped him overcome that shyness. Oh. Because well, he was put in front of audiences. And he began to realize, you know, the Q and A's that um, people liked his work, and they were responsive to it, and they kind of laughed at some of his jokes. And he wasn't sure. I mean, he wasn't a public speaker; he didn't have that public exposure. So after a while, you get used to that, and you become more confident. And then, of course, you become more confident about not just your filmmaking practice, but also about some of your social skills. So it sounds like sometimes people say, "Hey, you have strengths. Do you have weaknesses? Play to your strengths, right?" But it sounds like sometimes your weaknesses 
are actual weaknesses that you need to strengthen. So for example, talking to people, having charisma. Maybe sure. charisma is not ne necessarily something that you can just learn in a month, sure. but maybe social skills. Sure. No, I think um, the, great, the great challenge of who you are as an individual and what you see as your strengths and weaknesses is often, you know, your weaknesses are, are, are um, self-imposed in a funny way. You know, many people are very fearful about uh, exposing themselves or fearful about taking risks or doing something different. And I think my experience of life is, you know, if you feel hesitant in that way, just confront it and try and uh, overcome it. Um, and you'd be very surprised at what happens. I mean, I think one of the great learning experiences I've had in my life is there's certain things I didn't think I would do well. Um, and I've be, you know, proven myself somewhat, somewhat um, to the opposite. Uh, things that I didn't think I would enjoy, I've actually enjoyed. Things that I sort of shied away from, you confront and you say, well, yeah, this is not that difficult. Um, there's obviously things that you just don't want to do in your life and you shouldn't, <laughs> and you shouldn't necessarily say, okay, just because this is something I don't want to do, I'm, I'm gonna actually overcome this. If you don't want to do it, just don't do it. Um, but there's other things I think where people say, no, I wish I could be like this. You know, I wish I could speak in public. I mm -hmm. wish I could be more confident. And you actually just go out there and do it, and you find that you probably do a better job than you think. Right. I think there's so many, you know, the world is full of people who are somewhat f afraid of themselves, and afraid of contact, or afraid of making a mistake, or afraid of uh, appearing foolish in the eyes of somebody, you know, somebody else. And uh, it's crazy, if you've got something substantial to say, and, and substantial feelings and thoughts, um, you'll be fine. You know, about being looking like a fool and being foolish, Carl Jung said that the fool is the precursor to the hero. And the reason why is because for you to do anything amazing, you're going to look like an idiot for a long time because you don't know what the hell you're doing. So and I think that's that, normal. And I think a lot of people who are so-called heroes, at the end of the day, they feel that they were cowards originally and that they managed to overcome their cowardice and right. suddenly whatever people perceive as heroism right. was there in them. Yeah. They're just ordinary people yeah. at the end of the day, you know a coward, a hero, I, I think they probably share all the same qualities. Here's something I've been thinking about recently is that people who are fearless are not necessarily heroes because a hero is not the type of person who fights the dragon. A hero is the person who feels afraid and fights the dragon anyway. Totally. I think people with, without fear are probably short-lived at the end of the day. They will come to an early end. Like evolutionarily? <laughs> they will overexpose themselves pretty quickly if you're fearless. I yeah. mean, you, you need to, you need, there needs to be something that holds you yeah. back. Um, something that's human at the end of the day. I mean, let's face it, to be fearless is, is not human. Uh, it's somehow you think you're, so, you, you're immortal at that moment in time. Right. And of course, no one's immortal. Um, yeah. You know, and I think the, the, the bullies of life at the end of the day probably end up getting their comeuppance. Yeah. I, it sounds like you're talking about Donald Trump, but... <laughs> no, I actually have somebody else in mind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we okay. won't talk about that, though. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so about innovation in film, I remember the last time we were talking, you mentioned that you feel like filmmakers these days are not innovative enough. And we didn't get to finish that conversation, so I wanted to know if you could explain to me what you meant by that. Because I have some ideas on what innovation is, yeah, and I'll tell you. That's, that's a pretty broad subject. I mean, I, I, you can talk about it stylistically in terms of innovation, um, and I think that's probably one of the things I would say. And then, of course, there's the whole uh, element of production, distribution, exhibition. Right. Um, but I think when it comes to innovation of form, I think the, the form of cinema has become much safer, much more conventional, much more influenced by television. And so the risk-taking that I saw when I was younger doesn't exist in cinema in quite the same way anymore. I mean, it still exists, but not in the same way. It's not valued in the same way. I think that television has um, turned audiences and I think even the creators in a different direction. Meaning that it's very formulaic now as, as opposed to experimental? Formulaic, uniform, uh, it looks the same, it feels the same um, in every kind of way. I mean, it's built around stories, it's built around convention, it's built around three acts, it's built around uh, resolution of conflict uh, and an ending that sort of is tied up. And the cinema that really um, captured my ima imagination when I was younger was not that cinema at all. It was completely the opposite. It was a cinema that was much more experimental, much more cinema of ideas, a cinema of rebellion, a cinema of breaking every rule in the book and doing completely different things. And of course, when I was in my 20s, I responded to that. It was pretty exciting stuff. Um, it opened my eyes in a very different way to, to film. 
Um, and I just think nowadays I don't see that formal experimentation in the same kind of way. It's a much more flat and conventional way, I think, that, um, that both creators and the and audience have of, of looking at the world. I mean, I think audiences in particular are just not used to that experimentation anymore. They see so much visual material, so much of it on their tablets and, uh, and uh, you know, phones, but it's, of course, most of it's uh, television or it's feature film production that basically English language all comes from Hollywood, all looks somewhat the same. So I think that um, what we look for, and I think what a lot of other people look for, and it was interesting because I listened to Jeremy Podeswa, a Canadian filmmaker who's now turned to television. He was uh, giving some you know, thoughts, a little bit of a masterclass a couple of months ago, and he was talking about how he's now, he's now one of the hottest TV directors in, in the States. I mean, he's directing everything from Game of Thrones to Six Feet Under to the Wire. I mean, you name it, he's directed it. But one of the things he said was that the reason that he's doing so well is because he started in cinema, in film, and people actually looked to him. He had something different. He had um, an eye. He had uh, a way of handling film that, of course, was different than just the conventional TV director who'd come out of film school. So he thought that that was a value, and I, I, agree, I you know, I, I'm glad to hear that because um, I think long-form television is obviously now quite, quite adventuresome and it's doing very, very interesting things. Although I think it probably in a somewhat conventional way, um, but it's just, yeah, the, it's a culture or a moment in time now of less risk taking. I'd probably say that of not just cinema, but I'd say that of a lot of cultural activities, yeah. um, music, um, art, uh, literature. It's not, uh, you know, the, the great modernist moment where we sort of you know, writers ripped uh, literature apart, you know, which happened about a hundred years ago. That's kind of behind us now. Yeah. Um, so, but it was a very exciting, exhilarating time. In the same way that you know, painting a hundred years ago was, it went through that, the Cubist Picasso uh, phase, um, and just sort of destroyed representational art. Very exciting moment in the history of art. Um, so it's it's a more it's we're going through a different moment, I guess, in, culturally, in terms of not just film, but I think in, in terms of society and the, all, all the arts. It's very disruptive. So then you talk about the, you know, the notion of disruption and what's happening uh, th around that, because you know, we talk about a disruptive world, technology disrupting everything. Um, has it really changed film? Yes and no, it has. Um, it's easier to make a film. It's easier to get it distributed. Um, obviously, because there's, it's, you can make a film for ten thousand dollars, maybe even you know, in some cases, less than a thousand dollars, a feature film, and get it shown. You can stream it. If it's any good, you can probably get it into festivals. It may go a little bit further. So the old days of you know, you needed the technology of a thirty-five millimeter, you know, film production studio, actors, sound technicians. Those days are over, um, or they've been sur supplanted or augmented with all of this this other technology. Um, but I think that that disruption is really only in the, right, right now in the area of distribution and exhibition. But even there, I mean, cinema is so, um, what should I say, traditional and conventional in, the, in, in those terms that uh, I'm always surprised when I find that young filmmakers are still thinking in theatrical terms. Um, they still want the theatrical release. They right. still want the traditional form, even though, you know, they're in their 20s and they're making digital uh, films for, yeah. you know, Ten thousand bucks, twenty thousand right. bucks. They're still looking, at, you know, to the old ways of doing things. Now, obviously, there's a group of people that are not, um, and they're working in a different kind of way. Many of them are short form, you know, three minute, five minute films maximum. They're you know, kind of going on YouTube and they're creating their own audiences. Uh, I'm not sure there's been any great artistic breakthroughs there because it's the short form. Um, but I'm not sure what's going to happen when it comes to the feature film. I'm not sure how that's going to be distributed in the future, how it's going to be shown, whether it'll be a hybrid of traditional theatrical and uh, streaming services, which is what I think will probably happen. I mean, I think that uh, things are beginning to, to settle in a funny way. You're beginning to see um, massive, big tentpole, $100 million, $200 million productions, and there's very few of those being made. But there's you know maybe twenty or thirty of, them, the, the, of those will be made a year. Um, I think those will continue because they, those probably do need to be seen on 3D in IMAX on the big big yeah, screen. Yeah. It's hard to look at that in your iPad. Um, do you think there's a reason why Hollywood is banking on the superhero movies and like the same no new IPs basically? 
It's traditional, or I mean, it's predictable. It's not just traditional, it's predictable. Um, it seems to have gotten worse, but you can tell me in your experience no, in the sure past 30 years. Well, I think the people running studios are now no longer film executives with, you know, with love of the medium. They're really um, accountants and lawyers. I mean, they're going for the predictable, they're going for the investment. I mean, it's the, the business has been taken over in a kind of, in a you know, very different way um, than the old days. The old days, was, it was run by people who loved film, and they were prepared to take massive risks. Um, and art came out of that, even the Hollywood system. You know, a lot of great artists work within Hollywood. A lot of the great writers and, you know, all the visual talent went to Hollywood. Some of the great musicians went to Hollywood as well. Um, but I think now it's, and the people running the studios gave those people some freedom. I mean, the studio heads were not the greatest group of people. Um, but at the end of the day, they actually, they loved the medium. And then it sort of moved, it became obviously much more corporate. I mean, much more global, much more international. The risks were far greater. So you had a different set of people making those decisions. And I mean, you talk to almost anyone in Hollywood right now um, about who's making the decisions, who's running it. And they're not driven ultimately by the art. They're driven right. by the bottom line. And of course, you know, the longevity of a studio executive is pretty short. And you're, you know, you're judged on the, the, um, the lineup of films that you put together. And if you don't have um, an immediate hit, it really is about the short term. I mean, you've got shareholders, stockholders, et cetera, et cetera. So it's about the short term. It's not about long term stuff. So you know, there's, there's big turnover in a lot of these studios. So it's it's very difficult for people to actually have an imprint in the way that you know maybe a Robert Evans had in Paramount in the '70s, where he was obviously you know given his head and could actually uh, make some kind of impact. So I think those days are gone. Um, and it's it's. Um, yeah, so comic book films, I mean, obviously they're working. Some of them are working very, very well. Um, you'll get something like a Black Panther that comes along, I think, that surprises people. But I think the formula is essentially there. Yeah. Some of them, of course, are complete disasters. So it's not a question of just simply rubber stamping them or you know, stamping them out like an assembly line and they're all going to you know, be successful. It's not quite that simple. Um, but I think nowadays, with the amount of money that goes into marketing um, and distributing any film, you just want to make sure that you're putting your eggs into a basket that's probably got a lot of ancillary uh, possibilities. So it's not just about theatrical. I mean, you know, you look at Disney, who's yeah. the most successful studio right now. It's certainly not just about the film. It's about theme parks. It's about Dolls. merchandise. Yeah. It's about uh, food. It's about a, it's about an entire experience. So they can take the films that they're producing and you know move it into a whole production line of activities which are global. Uh, and generate an immense amount of, of revenue and income. Right. So, um, so you have this kind of, on one extreme you have the huge great big budget films, and the other extreme you have a lot of people working, I would say, increasingly in the low budget area. I mean increasingly. What I think has been hollowed out is the mid-budget film. Um, the film that I would say is anywhere from 30 to 50 million dollars. Yeah. Um, and those are the films that used to be, the ones that went on to Oscar nominations yeah. and you know won the Oscars. And I think increasingly, if you look at the last five years of the Oscars, they're truly low-budget films. I mean, they're less than that. Some of those films have been laid, made for far less than uh, $10 million, you know, a film like uh, Moonlight. Um, so it's, um, it's, you know, it's, Hollywood is going through this kind of, this moment of extremes, uh, big budget to a lot of low-budget work. And I, I would say that the rest of cinema around the world as well. I mean, there's still an immense amount of films that are being made, but for what market? local market. It's hard for them to, to travel internationally. I would say the, the era of the foreign language film is basically almost over. Um, I mean, it'll continue clearly because of domestic, um, for domestic reasons, but those films will not travel in the same way that they used to. It's becoming increasingly difficult. So festivals have sort of plugged that, that, that gap. I think that there's obviously a need or a desire on the part of a smaller niche audience to see this work. They're curious about films from around the world. They want to see um, films with some kind of cultural meaning, um, social meaning that are very regional and very local. Uh, but I think that film festivals will probably fill that gap. Right. When filmmakers go to film festivals, especially yours, TIFF, do you see them making some mistake over and over? Like they're not talking to critics, sales agents, or producers, or something like that, or they tend to just go to the films and go home or they talk to people but they try and sell them and then that makes them look bad. Is there some mistake that you see them making? I think the game has become so much more sophisticated now to be honest. Maybe that, maybe that was the case 25 years ago. 
Um, but I think now everyone's so aware of film festivals. It's not just the filmmakers who come, it's also the studios and the distributors, some of the key distributors. They've learned so much over that 25 year period. They've learned how to use festivals. So filmmakers now are really not alone when it comes to the festival game. Yeah. They're usually so smart um, that even if they don't know which festivals to go to, they know right away the festivals are important. So th there's a game plan. You know, once you've made your film, that's one part of the game plan. The next part of the game plan is to actually get it shown. And so I think you know, producers and people that help a filmmaker put the entire package together, they say, okay, fine, we've just got to crack the festival game now. And there's enough people who've been to festivals, there's increasingly more and more people who've had the festival experience. You know, your friends or a friend of a friend, you can talk to them and say, so what do I do? And um, so I think there's, you know, tried and true mechanisms to actually get your, your film in front of the right people. Right. That um, there's a pathway that's already been developed. Can you explain the festival game and what that pathway kind of looks like? Well, once you have your film in a festival, invited to a festival, it's, there's a couple of, of agendas you want to achieve. If you don't have distribution, it's how am I going to get distribution for my film? So how am I going to get it bought by somebody? Um, if you do have, if your film is invited and you, you do have distribution, it's a different part of the game. You just want probably media attention more than anything else. You may want to sell it to unsold territories. You may just have a North American distribution deal, so you may want it sold, but you probably, you're, as if you're a North American filmmaker, you're looking for the local media to help with its, its uh, potential launch and right. distribution and campaign. if you don't have distribution? If you don't have distribution, it's a, different, it's a different part of the game. You're looking for sales agents from around the world. You're looking for distributors who can buy the film in North America or anyone from around the world who um, would potentially buy your film in, in, in every territory. I mean, there's people who come to Toronto literally from every continent, so you can sell your film into Asia, Latin America, Europe, um, and of course North America. And how do you go about doing that? Like, let's say you got your film in a film festival, it's screened at TIFF, let's say, so then afterwards, hey, I'm looking for a sales agent, or you walk around with a name tag that says that, or you say, no, hey, are no, you a sales agent, are you no, a sales agent? Not at all, because we publish a list of the sales agents that are coming to the festival. I mean, we have basically an industry center, which is like a dating service between filmmakers and the industry itself. That's a very, very important part of the, of the business that gets done at the festival. So we want to make sure that those connections actually happen, and we have a full-time staff here to grease those, what, the, okay. the, the, the wheels of that. So, um, and that, most festivals have that, or is that unique to TIFF? Uh, it's unique, I would say, to the large festivals, because business is only really done at the large festivals. The five that I've mentioned, right. um, Cannes, Berlin, Venice, less so, Sundance and Toronto, are the ones where real serious business happens. And other festivals like Rotterdam, Locarno, San Sebastian, are, and Pusan are probably, you know, they're also very, very important. It's the second tier, I would say. Um, but the big festivals, is where most of the industry come. Not all, but most of the industry. And of course, the biggest ones are where the international industry really do so come. Is there a point in, in even submitting to festivals that aren't the top tier or the second tier? Of course there is, because you want your film shown. And even if you get media attention, you can take that media attention and you can se send your film off via a link or whatever to potential distributors and say, hey, I've got a great review from so-and-so. Here's the link of my movie. It's actually been in another festival, or it's been at a whole series of festivals. That gets you, it's a gatekeeping process, so that gets you through the door. As opposed to your films being shown nowhere, you have no reviews. So you're sort of scrambling up the slope, and you can scr you scramble up the slope whichever way you possibly can. Um, and my advice to any filmmaker is get yourself into as many festivals as you possibly can. Be strategic, but you may not get into the top tier immediately. Um, as long as you're getting into some of the festivals, you've got that kind of, uh, you can put it in your CV, and um, yeah, that, that opens doors when you're looking for financing. I mean, for some countries around the world, f festival exposure is the most important thing they can get. I mean, it actually opens the door to fundraising, or to, to, to funds financing for their future film projects. And for major filmmakers, that's, for some in, in, in other parts of the world, that's very, very important. Right. If you yeah. win a prize at a major festival, you'll on, automatically get a certain amount of money, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, festivals are, are really important triggers to future projects. Mentioning funds and financing, have you witnessed or been a part of any pitches, film pitches, and if so, do you have any advice for filmmakers who are pitching? I've seen, we do a pitching session here at the festival called Pitch This, so I've kind of gone to those, although they're very, very, um, what should I say, they're incredibly professional, they're almost acted out. And uh, I'm not sure, you, oh, you know, it lasts for about 10 minutes, you have, the whole thing is carefully scripted, 
it's like a, uh, a scene from a piece of theater. And I'm not sure when you get, you know, you get into uh, Paramount's office or anybody else's office, you know, that it's going to be the same, exactly. Uh, or you grab a coffee with somebody in, you know, <laughs> here at a festival, yeah. or you're, you're, you're into, into a meeting in a hotel uh, in another festival. You I mean, you don't get the opportunity to do that. It's like, you know, tell, tell me what your film's about in, in two sentences. Um, you've got five minutes to, to, to persuade me. So, you know, different kind of pitch at that point in time than, you know, as I said, the pitches that I've seen that are, are pretty, you know, well prepared. Have I sat next to somebody who's pitching a film? Not really. I mean, I've had to pitch so many people myself about the festival, especially in the early days. Okay, so what are some tips around that? Some things that you've noticed that work and don't work, some things that make people yawn, some things that make people excited? I think authenticity is the most important thing. I think knowing your knowing the person opposite the table is really important. What are the triggers for them? What's important for them? What do they want to hear? Or what's what sh you know? What do you think they should hear? And maybe what do they want to hear? So it's, there's no point in going in and making an artistic pitch to somebody who's just interested about economics and finance, obviously. So you know, if if I'm trying to sell the festival or trying to sell. Uh, somebody who could potentially give money to the organization. It, it'll be a mix of the two things, but it'll probably be more the financial. This is the economic impact of the festival. This is the economic impact of TIF. This is what the uh, festival in TIF does for the city. This is what it does for the uh, province. This is what it does for the, the country. This is what it does in terms of helping Canadian film production, young Canadian filmmakers. You know, so you've got, you, there's a whole bunch of areas that you sort of touch on. Uh, apart from, and you talk about the international aspect of it, um, but I wouldn't necessarily, you know, hammer home the artistic merit and value of what we're doing. The best films from around the world. I mean, I think depending uh, on who you're talking to, depending upon who you're talking to, sure. If you know it's somebody who's really, really interested in the artistic and far less interested in the other stuff, of course, you know, that's what I feel most comfortable with because that's where I came from. And if that's somebody that's, that really wants to know that, wants to know the depth of your knowledge and the depth of your reach, um, and they want to know what filmmakers you're associating with and what filmmakers you've helped, then of course you, know, you have to draw on that side of your brain. Um, and then there's other people who you know, want to know how much corporate money you're raising, right. and what's the size of your budget, and what's the percentages, and how's it grown. How much has it grown every single year, and uh, you know what's the uh, the ROI if I'm a company that wants to get involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, different pitches for different people. Um, so basically, know what they want and know what they want to hear, then filter that with what you authentically have to say, because you don't want to just sell them whatever they want to hear. Then you're selling out versus selling. I think at the end of the day, they're probably looking for passion. They want to be. Um, I wouldn't say amused. They want to be grabbed. Uh, they're getting so many pitches from so many people. It's, it's so, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. How do you sort yourself out from everyone else? And uh, that can be tricky. It can be really tricky if you're not a natural salesperson. And if you're not, you probably need to get somebody who is close to you, know, a producer or um, a producer's rep who can do that kind of selling right. for you. I mean, some filmmakers are absolutely terrible at it. You know, they really don't enjoy it at all. They don't want to go into pitch sessions. They don't want to raise money. For them, it's they're the artist, and uh, some of them are very soft-spoken and shy, and some not that articulate. You know, they speak visually or they think visually. Um, so you know, it's difficult if you if you're that type of person to actually go into a pitch session with a, a really tough-nosed producer who's been around the block um, and seen it all. But you know, there's common ground. Some of the the hard-nosed producers really do know talent. They recognize talent. Um, and they've probably got a different screening process. Sometimes it's very, very difficult to penetrate through to the top. I mean, they'll, the top will always be screened by assistants, by people who are pre-reading. They just don't have time. Um, you know, they, they've got a group of people that they work with. Of course, they're looking for new talent, but they're relying on other people to find that talent for them right. as opposed to them finding it necessarily themselves. Sounds like you have a lot going on, and I want to know what your morning huh. routine looks like. So what do you do on a daily basis to prime yourself? So for example, Tony Robbins has a, a routine that he does. He wakes up at a certain time and then he does this meditation thing and then he thinks about okay. things he's grateful for. So I walk to work every morning. It's a 50 minute walk. I don't... Five zero. Five zero. Yeah, it's almost an hour. I used to cycle, but since we moved here... Even in the cold? Even the cold, year round. Yeah, I'm a huge skier, outdoor guy. I love all four seasons. Um, Ottawa, God's sake, is much, okay. much colder than Toronto. Right. I've got all the clothes, so I, I walk in. 
come rain, shine, snow, whatever. Um, so I walk in, 50 minutes, clears my head. I used to cycle, as I said, um, but I kind of, the cycle's in the basement right now for a bunch of reasons. I think it's more stressful than walking, cycling, um, to be honest, and of course I'm here faster. So, uh, and it actually, to, be, to become even more detailed about it, it's the muscle group I want to use, is uh, the muscle group that I use when I walk as opposed to when I'm cycling, because uh, I'm a big skier and hiker. Um, so I walk in 50 minutes, and that's my daily routine Then I get in here. You know, I read the newspaper every day before I come in. That kind of zones me out, too. I enjoy, as opposed to an iPad, I don't want to be on, a, you know, uh, a visual, visual stimulation. I still enjoy reading. I'm a big right. reader, and I enjoy paper and the physical object. So I read the newspapers over breakfast, uh, kind of zone out that way, and, uh, you know, shave. Et cetera, et cetera, get dressed, come in, walk, and then you're in the office. Um, often you have meetings that start at about 10 o'clock in the morning, sometimes earlier. Um, obviously, a lot of my responsibilities are to the board, and there's a variety of board committees, and sometimes those meetings start at about 8, 8.30 in the morning, our finance and audit committee, um, and when, when they meet, I'm in here for those meetings. I meet with my board chair on a regular basis. We have breakfast about once a month, um, so I do that as well. Sometimes there's other kinds of breakfasts. People are in town, they want to see me. Yeah. Um, then you're in the office. You have, there's a series of meetings. I used to be involved in many more meetings than I am now, which is nice, so I've kind of cleared that. I used to have many more reports than I do now. So the, the reports that I do have, I meet with them regularly. Um, and then there's just you know, outside uh, or people who are um, looking for meetings um, of a whole variety of things. They've got ideas, projects they want to pitch to you. Like what? Like an extension of TIFF, like, hey, I have an idea for a subsection of your festival, or I have, an, I have a film, watch this film. Every, well, no, I don't do as many of those meetings anymore. I'll just push, you know, if there's a filmmaker who wants to get a film you in the festival. Exactly. Um, it's more people who have different kinds of ideas, and they know me. Um, and it can be everything from Festival Street. You know, we've got an idea to do, uh, to link uh, the, the, the kind of outdoor activities you have on Festival Street with uh, a fundraiser we want to, to you know, for our particular um, charity. Uh, and can we somehow link up with you guys and, and do this together? Um, you know, so that's one part of it. So you have people p pitching you? All the time, okay. for sure. I mean, there was a period when a lot of people came in and pitched about streaming services. Um, could we somehow link up with the festival and um, work out how we get festival films, Cinematech films online? Something like, 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 you don't have to give any details, but something like, let's say Netflix might approach you and say something like, hey, this film and this film is being screened at your festival, but people, not everybody can go to the physical location. Can we screen it on Netflix simultaneously? Something like that? Uh, yes, a little bit like that. It's probably more third-party entrepreneurs who come into you with an idea, so trying to get into the uh, into the business or trying to get into the the game, the digital game, and figure they've got uh, something that could actually generate money. Oh, okay. So uh, as opposed to the big guys, the big guys, you know, Apple, Amazon, uh, Netflix, we go out and pitch them. Uh, as opposed to, but these are really third-party people who come and say, I think there's a niche here that we can, you know, TIFF's got a great brand, uh, we can provide the, the back end here, what does that look like, uh, et cetera. So for years we had those kinds of people like knocking on our door all the time. Okay. Uh, um, so it's, yeah, it's a whole variety of things. You know, people um, sometimes in other art forms, in a theater, opera, music, um, we've got something that links up with film, can we do something together, can we pr cross promote, cross market? Um, and then, of course, you're trying to think through the organization. So you're trying to meet with people. Um, you're, you're looking to identify people out there or organizations out there who can actually help you, give you advice, drive you forward. If you're stuck in certain areas, um, we, every once in a while we bring consultants on board. So you're talking to the consultants in terms of what their findings are, what you're looking for. Uh, and often before you go to consultants, of course, you're talking to your network of, of people and contacts, both internally and externally, in terms of, you know, here's a problem, we're trying to crack it, what do you think? Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, as I said, it's, it, every day can be very different. As you get closer to some of the key moments in the organization, you know, the festival being one of them, TIFF Kids being another, you know, a different set of problems arise at that point in time. Um, but, you know, my job now is I, I've delegated a lot of authority to a lot of different people, so they're handling a lot of those problems, and the big problems surface up to me. 
you know, the ones that really kind of need uh, my attention or the attention of uh, a bunch of, of the thinkers at the top end. Yeah, there's this, I think it's Steve Jobs or, or Jeff Bezos, and he said, by the time a problem comes to me, it's by definition a big problem because otherwise it would have got solved earlier. You're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. So you I, shouldn't really, you know, micromanage an organization when it gets big. Um, you want to know how it operates. And of course, I've been around for such a long time that I know the details of most of it. Um, so, you know, so when, when people are coming to you and making certain internal pitches, you can ask all the right questions around, do we really need to do it or can we do it this way? Um, but you don't want to micromanage, you really don't. You want to hire the best people and let them get on with the job. But you do want to steer the ship. And of course, when the organization gets bigger and bigger, sometimes it's, you want to make sure that everyone's aligned. So you don't have people moving off in slightly different directions. So, you know, there's times when I think good CEOs, um, you run towards problems. And so, you know, as, as Steve Jobs or whoever said, you know, by the time it surfaces up to me, it's a big problem. That's the job of a CEO to actually run towards major problems. And I think that's pretty easy to identify. You know, there's. When you things. say run towards, do you mean to crave them because, like, you want to solve them, or do you mean to just no, when not shy problem, away? Exactly. You don't shy away from them. You move towards them. You, you don't. You don't back off. You actually rush right towards them, especially in this day and age, where there's not much time to avoid things because you know social media, et cetera, et cetera, right. will magnify it. But you need to rush in as opposed to step back. Yeah. Um, you don't need to be a, hot, a hothead. So you, you, know, you need to be very, very careful and calculating about it, but you actually do need to not be afraid of, of problem solving. And of course, that's what I've always loved, is the problem solving part of the job. It's very satisfying, Yeah. very challenging. Did you study any business books? This is me now curious. No. So how did you get to be a CEO without the background of that? Obviously, you got it through your connections and you were talented and you showed some promise, so every once in a while you'd move up and then move up and then move sure. up. But then with regards to the growth of TIFF, so How did you get that that's knowledge? a pretty interesting question. I thought a lot about it. I think um, part of it has to do with just my own personal background and part of it has to do with my educational background and some of my interests. Um, I went to an English boarding school and leadership was a big, big thing that people talked about and you were given an immense amount of responsibility when you were young. Um, you know, I was head of house, school prefect. Um, all that kind of thing at a certain point. So you obviously talked about leadership, saw leadership. My father was in the military. Uh, he was an army officer, so of course military and leadership is very important. Um, I thought I was going to be a military historian. I read an immense amount. I still do read an immense amount. Of course, leadership is so crucial when it comes to... leadership books? Or you read history? Is that I read history, to be honest. I think the lessons of leadership are in history. I mean, of course, you can discover a lot through business, but I haven't read Steve Jobs, you know, any biography of, of him. I mean, that, that interests me in, in a lesser kind of way, or the, the captains of industry. Um, no, I was much more interested in um, a different kind of leadership like that, of course, I'm not sure that it translates entirely to, to, to a cultural organization, but of course, a lot of it does. Yeah. It's how you, how you inspire people. You know, how you're strategic, uh, what's important to focus on, you know, both delegation and, um, you know, what you hold on to yourself, um, all those kinds of things. So, no, and of course, you just learn by, by, by being on the job, but I think you also learn by observing. I mean, one of the key things for me was actually watching leadership, both good and bad. And I think I've watched some very good leaders and I watched some extremely bad, or worked for some very good leaders and some very bad leaders. And I would say I learned more from working for bad leaders than I did working with good leaders because, because of course I said to myself, if I ever got into a leadership position, I will never do this. I'll do exactly the opposite. I mean, this is so stupid. This is ridiculous. Um, because they put me through the, the meat grinder as well as other employees around me. So you saw that in action. You said, okay, I'm going to, you know, if I'm given the responsibility and the power and the authority, I'm going to do it in a very, very different way. So you learn. I mean. My first 10 years in Ottawa, I learned an immense amount. And, um, I, and I observed by watching people fail or do it, you know, do it well, or in, some case, in most cases, actually do it very badly. And um, I'm not sure I'm a perfect leader, but I certainly, you know, you, you talk, every once in a while when you, you're faced with challenges, you kind of go back to those lessons and you're, I think you, you kind of confront yourself in an honest way. You're very real about yourself. That's the most important thing is to actually not fake it when uh, you come to who and what you are. You are, you know, to be very aware of your strengths, but 
to be extremely aware of your weaknesses right. and um, to either confront your weaknesses or to hire to your weaknesses. And that's always been one of my philosophies. You know, if, if something needs shored up and you don't think you can do it yourself, you go out and find that help. I and mean, that's the most important thing. Absolutely. Or reach out. Not be afraid of reaching out. My last question is, what do you find challenging these days? Whether it's part of your job or maybe it's juggling work life, whatever it is, what do you feel like is most challenging? I think the most challenging thing is at this moment in time, um, what's going to happen to the industry and the field that I'm in? Uh, I think that's probably the biggest challenge. I don't think anyone's really clear about the path forward. Um, you know, is the model, the old models, are they going to work in the future? And I think there was a long period of time where the, those models did work. And I think I'm sort of leaving almost at a moment where it's a transitional moment. It You're really leaving? is. Yeah, I'm stepping down at the end of this year. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, this is my last year as CEO. Yeah. So I'm leaving at a moment where I, felt, I feel very comfortable because I've been a part of that, having to deal with some of it. But um, I think it's, you know, obviously this, this moment is going to continue. And I think that the path forward for film, for cinema, moving image, um, our audience, the city, uh, I think all those kinds of things are in a moment of great transition and great change. And if you slip behind, suddenly you find yourself being left behind in the dust. I mean, just, everything's happening so quickly right now. Um, so. I mean, I, I loved the challenge when I was in the job of thinking all that stuff through. And I think there's a certain point in time where you sort of say to yourself, okay, um, I've dealt with all those challenges. There's a new set of challenges. Uh, maybe they're not challenges for me to deal with. Maybe I don't, A, have the energy or the expertise or, you know, you just don't have the feel for it. And uh, that may well be the case right now. So I feel like I'm going out at exactly the right moment for me. Mm -hmm. I've given the organization everything I can give it. I think it's arrived at a really good place. And I think it's now you know, time for somebody else to take what's here and think it through and give it a new, you know, new perspective, a new vision, a new life. Um, it's, it's here what I've created with a whole bunch of other people. Um, it's, been, it's been very... How many years have you been a CEO? 24. It's a long time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a long time. I mean, I've lasted more than most CEOs last, obviously, in private sector and uh, in the cultural world as well. So, yeah, a quarter of a century is a long time. Yeah. With regards to is the industry changing or moving into something completely new, I have a mathematical answer for that. So I'm a mathematician by training, sure. a filmmaker afterwards. And so, so just follow through this explanation, okay? So there's this thing called the secretary problem in math. And the problem is, let's say you have a hundred secretaries to interview, and you want to pick the best one. But when you say, when you, you only get to interview them one-on-one, -on -one, and they come, and then if you have to say yes or no on the spot, otherwise, as soon as you say no, they can get a job elsewhere. So as soon as you say no, you don't get, access, you don't get to call them back. Sure. So how do you, what's the strategy to pick the best one? And well, what would you say? Do you have any <laughs> thoughts right off the bat? Complete clarity in terms of what you're looking for from that person. Okay, that's a hiring, that, that's like, that's more of a mindset thing, but mathematically, like, do you want to, do you say yes to the, do you say yes to the first person who's 90% of what you want, or do you go through uh, 90 people and then say yes all of a sudden because you want the best of this whole bunch. Okay. Well, no, you may see your best person and the third person or you may see the best person, the right. 50th person, exactly. or the best person may be the 100th person. Exactly. Okay. So that's the problem. So that's the problem. So there's a mathematical solution to this and it's called an optimal stopping problem. It's when do you stop? When's the optimal time to stop? And it turns out it's 37 people in, you mm -hmm. stop, and the number, the reason, how you calculate that is beyond the scope of this. Sure. But you get to 37 people and you actually say no to all of them. And what you're doing is you're just sussing out what is the playing field like. Mm -hmm. So the only information you have is, is this person better than the rest? Yep. Okay, so now you know roughly how good people are. Then after 37, you say yes to the first person who's better than all the other people. Mm. And then you're most likely to actually pick the best one out of the 100. 
So obviously it's probabilistic because the first person could have been the best one, or the second, or the third, up to sure. 37. Okay, so now that we know that, you can also apply that to, well, you can apply it to dating. It turns out that if you want to, you only have a finite amount of people you can date in your life, who are you going to marry? Right. So date the first 37% and then say no to them. Right. Okay, so you can apply it to there. But then you can also apply it to casinos. So it turns out, let's say you have 100 slot machines, and you have to um, pull the, the, what is it called, the lever, pull the lever down on each of them, and some have different chances than others. So you just keep going, keep going, keep going until you reach about 37% and then you pick the one that is better than the rest. Now how this applies to Hollywood is it's as if they either know or wisdom of the crowds that the industry is changing or dying in some way. Maybe it'll be resurrected in a new form, the innovation that we're talking about. So it's as if they've pulled these levers down with all these different types of films and now they see the end. So they're like, okay, let's go back on the levers that actually work. We don't have time to risk on those ones, on the new ones. So right. that's a mathematical. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Never heard that one before. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now we have a student question, which is, all right, Pierce, can you approve of someone's movie? And if so, what's your personal cell phone number? Haha, <laughs> that's my <laughs> joking one. Okay. So the next one is actually comes from someone at William F. White's, and they say they want to know, are we seeing a devaluing of the short film because Bravo Facts is no longer supporting short films? And I have a... a Just because Bravo Facts is not sh supporting short films, there's a devaluation of the short film? It's too bad that they're not, of course, because yeah. it was fantastic. But things live and die, and uh, programs you know, at some point in time expire, and you just sort of move on. I mean, it was obviously a very important program, did all kinds of things. Short filmmakers, though, will always find resources, I think, to, uh, to make their films, right. especially short filmmakers. Yeah. That's in my experience. You don't need a program like Bravo Facts to necessarily go out and make a short film. I mean, some of the best shorts that I saw didn't went, go through that program. Right. So it's sad when things like that collapse, and all you have to do is just use your wits and resources and go out and uh, find the money, scrape it up. I'm and hearing one of the things that you said, and one of the things you said was, Experimentation is, you, don't, you haven't seen many experimental films in the past little while, that innovation has been low. And I'm wondering, as you were saying that there's a form, television has set that form in a way. Is it because these experimental films are just, they actually are being made, but they're not good, so they don't trickle up to you? Or are they good, and then they just still don't get to you because the public, who is a gatekeeper before you, because you don't just get to see every single film, right? They are so trained in looking at films in this particular way, three acts, res resolve at the end, that they don't even view that experimental film as worthy no, of being fed up. I would say um, the, the people experiment, I won't, I won't say experimental films, I would say people experimenting with the form, there's fewer of them, that's all. Um, we're looking for that material, I think every festival program is looking for it. There's just. It, it's, a, it's a cultural thing right now. It's just less desire on the part of the creative artists to play with the medium because uh, I don't think they're rewarded in the same kind of way that they used to be rewarded. And it's also a different kind of cultural moment. I mean, the moment that I grew up in, 60s and 70s, was very disruptive. And of course, it was a point in time when people were uh, blowing all the old forms apart. I mean, that was the great thing about that era. That it wasn't just film, it was obviously music too, uh, and, and lots of other things, fashion, style. Mm -hmm. um, it was just an you know, explosive moment, in, a cultural moment. And now you see a consolidation to a Completely, yeah. It's a, very, it's a much safer form. society in all kinds of ways. I mean, there's still massive disruption, but it's... It's, it's, it's in it's, the distribution end and not in the form end. Well, yeah, I think it's a much more conservative time. It really is. I think the younger generation is much more conservative in terms of their tastes. So they're, they're not searching out things that, I mean, I see it in my niece, uh, you know, who's uh, in her late 20s. She doesn't respond to the kind of material that I respond to. Um, and I'm not saying that there aren't people at 29 who, who you know, who won't respond to, to you know, more innovative and formal work, of, of course. But I think it was just, when I grew up, it was much more pervasive and it was rewarded and it was what, a lot of people were looking for society. It was looking for difference, that kind of difference. It explains the, uh, the fascination with European art cinema right. of, of that era because the Fellinis, Antonioni's, Bergman's, Godard's, they were, all those filmmakers were doing things that were so different. And of course it, it began to enter the mainstream. And uh, I think that, that, that those days of entering the mainstream for formerly inventive work are over. Right. Um, it still gets done but you won't find it in the mainstream. It's not as influential. It's not being talked about in the same kind of I way. 
Um, I mean, it's funny, I just did a, a session at, in his college a couple of days ago, and I had a young Chinese filmmaker who's living here in Toronto come up to me and said he's made a very experimental short film. He's made other short films as well, but he's having a very difficult time placing his experimental short in festivals. He's been turned down by so many of them, and uh, he's wondering if it's because, you know, his, his friends all like his traditional shorts, but they don't like this one. Um, so he's just wondering what he should do, you know, if you should continue in that vein. Is there any festival that's going to actually... And what did you, you say? Um, I said two things. I said, of course, there'll be people out there who will respond, and that's important, and it may take you a long time to get through to them, but it's also becoming much more difficult in my experience. Uh, I think even as, as I look at the festivals around the world, I think that they're more conservative in terms of their selection. All right, Peter, you had a quick question? Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, my, my question is that um, I, I've been in the basement, uh, and, and you just uh, allowed me to come out and, and ask you a question now. But <laughs> Knocked I've, on the door. Hey, Peter, come. for a year and a half, and I'm starting casting now, and it's a low-budget, $100,000 budget that I have. That I'm financing it myself, right? And I'm I'm just sort of preparing myself now for when it, I would love to get my film into TIFF. I mean, it would, this would be a wonderful a moment for me. Um, uh, and other filmmakers too are making low budget films. What are the schedules like for for entering into the into the film festival? And and what are, is there any tips about you know entering into the, the festival? Should you get your film in as early as possible? And uh, yeah, they're all good questions, they're all very practical. Um, I would say probably not get your film in as early as possible because there's a period where it can be too early and we've seen nothing else, so you have no context. You know, the first film that you see of the year is, okay, and that's it absolutely is a masterpiece and you sort of recognize it and you love it. You're going to say, well, I've got another 200 films or more to see and I have no context. So yours may be in the middle, it may be one of the best ones, or it may actually not make it. Um, so, so that's one, I mean, I, we have deadlines, et cetera, et cetera. The optimal stopping problem just now. The optimal stopping problem. It's like you're not going to say yes to the first one because you have no context. Exactly. It even applies well, to film go. festival mm -hmm. submissions. There you go. But anyway. So, um, so I would just be a part of the regular submission process. Mm -hmm. I'd make sure that your film is finished, as finished as it possibly could be. We often see films where um, they're still in production, some of them aren't even fine cuts, or some of them are basically a fine cut and no effects. Maybe it's all temp music. So you're looking at something that you're not actually going to present. Um, we're all used to doing that, but of course, the closer you can get to a final print, the better it is for us. Um, I always say that to people. Just show it to us once. I've had filmmakers who've actually shown it to us and, sit, and then you know, we've, we've kind of had a reaction to it. And they say, oh, well, we're going to go away, and we're going to cut it, we're going to take five minutes out, and we're going to do this to the music. And you sort of say to yourself, well, I don't think five minutes is really going to solve the problem. And, um, you know, sometimes it's your friends or you know them really well or the people are really insistent. And that, please, please look at it, et cetera, et cetera. I spent so much money, all my savings, all my earnings. You've got to have another look at it. And I think festival programmers were so, there's so many films that we're looking at, it's really difficult to look at a film for the second time. So you've kind of got one chance. I mean, occasionally you've got two, but you've really got one chance. And even if you've got a second chance and we've seen it, your mind's pretty well made up. It really is. Um, so put the film in front of festival programmers in its optimum state. Um, and of course, sometimes that's very difficult because of the deadlines of festivals. You're trying to get to, uh, into a festival, be it Toronto or any of the other ones, and they've got very specific deadlines that we can't see a film beyond this date. People are rushing to finish it, and um, which is fine. And as I say, sometimes at the end of the day, we're, we, we end up looking at films that are uh, in quite rough shape. But I would say the ones that you look at in rough shape would have to be from some of the major filmmakers as opposed to somebody you have no relationship with. Uh, I mean, you're prepared to sort of say to a, a filmmaker with a big reputation, with a track record, this is pretty rough, but yeah, we can imagine that you'll pull it together and it, it'll actually uh, cohere. Um, but even then, we rarely do that. It's funny, you know, you don't see things that are too messy. So I always say to, to younger filmmakers, um, make sure you've got the best cut available, as much of it as, as possible that's there. Um, and if it's not ready, take your time. Get it right. It's more important to get it right because you've only got one chance in this world with your film and just delay it. 
you know, move on to another festival. If you're thinking of getting into TIFF and it's not ready uh, for whatever reason, just make sure that you've got your film right and then either hold it for a year or just move it along to the other uh, cycle of film festivals uh, that follow us. Slam Dance, Sundance, um, Rotterdam, etc., etc. There's a whole bunch of festivals that follow us. I, I actually know very little about TIFF. I've been stuck in that basement, right? You know, right. I go back to CFDC days with Michael Spencer. And wow. I, I, I had two you knew Michael, right? movies back, back then. Oh, really? Yeah, and I lived in Ottawa too, and I, I did a lot of D&D stuff. And, right. You know, okay. Um, but uh, I, I guess uh, I, I've just started to recirculate and just start to find the whole film community. Um, uh, is there any other things that TIFF offers, uh, independent filmmakers? Yeah, there's a big, uh, a whole group of mentorship programs that you could probably look around at. Um, I'm not sure how many of them you'd qualify for, Peter, but um, we do have a mentorship program for producers. We have um, a talent lab for filmmakers. They tend to be emerging filmmakers for a second. Um, features, sometimes just short filmmakers. It's a very small group of people. Um, We've got some script mentorship stuff. We're getting into that a little bit more as well. Um, we don't really have a lot of um, PD opportunities, professional development opportunities. I mean, during the festival, yes, panels, workshops, et cetera, et cetera, but really focused stuff. It's, um, there's a scholarship or two, um, one for a script writer that I think is still in place. We're trying to do more for, of course, women filmmakers, so we're raising all kinds of money to help them. Um, but I could certainly put you in touch with the person who runs our industry program and give you a sense of what that would look like. 